Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messi, and today we are having a look at an absolutely fascinating relic of the very dawn of the atomic age. This vial here contains a sample of trinitite, which is a mineral formed by the world's first nuclear detonation, the Trinity Test. On July 16, 1945, at 5.29 a.m. Mountain War Time, the Trinity Gadget, an implosion-type device fueled by 6.2 kilograms of plutonium-239, was detonated from the top of a 30-meter tower near Alamogordo, New Mexico. Just four hours later, a team of radiochemists led by Herbert Anderson from the University of Chicago's Metallurgical, or MET, laboratory approached Ground Zero to collect soil samples. Their goal was to measure the ratio of unfissioned plutonium to plutonium fission products, such as strontium-90, zirconium-97, molybdenum-99, cerium-144, and samarium-153, which would indicate the proportion of the plutonium core, or pit, that was actually converted into energy, and thus the explosive yield of the bomb. To create a baseline for these measurements, two months earlier on May 7, Manhattan Project scientists conducted what was known as the 100-ton test. This involved assembling and detonating 100 tons of TNT in Composition B high explosive atop a wooden platform built 730 meters southeast of the Trinity Shot Tower. Threaded through this explosive pile was a length of PVC tubing containing 1,000 curie of reactor bred plutonium from the Hanford site in Washington, dissolved in nitric acid. Now, as the radiation intensity around ground zero immediately following the Trinity test was predicted to be around 1,000 Röntgen per hour, enough to kill a person after only 30 minutes of exposure, two Sherman tanks were specially modified to protect Anderson and his team as they collected samples. Now, I don't think I've ever mentioned this on this channel, but among my many hobbies, I am an avid model builder, and one of my most recent projects was this model of that very Sherman tank. As you can see, the gun was removed and the mantlet covered over, while oxygen tanks were added to the hull to supply the crew with fresh air under positive pressure. The crew compartment was also lined with two inches of lead plating, which attenuated the incoming radiation by a factor of around 40. Now, the original sampling method involves simply opening a hatch on the bottom of the hull and reaching down and manually scooping out a sample from the ground below. But a safer method utilizing rockets was soon developed. So as you can see on this model, a launch rack for five sampling rockets was mounted on the tank's rear deck. Each rocket was tipped with a small sampling scoop capable of collecting around 500 grams of soil and connected to a long steel cable and a winch, allowing samples to be retrieved from 500 meters outside the crater. In the event of a mechanical breakdown, a second tank was also modified as a recovery vehicle. Now the samples collected and analyzed by Anderson's team revealed an explosive yield of 18.6 kilotons. Later, in 1963, this was revised the currently accepted figure of 21 kilotons. As the first people to approach Ground Zero, Anderson's team was also the first to observe the bomb's destructive effects. The detonation carved out a crater approximately 80 meters across and 1.4 meters deep, and completely vaporized the steel shot tower, leaving only the shattered remains of the tower footing sticking out of the ground. But the most remarkable observation was that for around 300 meters around ground zero, the desert sand had been fused into a thin layer of bottle green glass. A Time Magazine article from September 17, 1945, written after an official press tour of the Trinity site, vividly described the scene. Seen from the air, the crater itself seems a lake of green jade, shaped like a splashy star, and set in a seared disk of burnt vegetation half a mile wide. From close up, the lake is a glistening encrustation of blue-green glass 2,400 feet in diameter, formed when the molten soil solidifies in air. The glass takes strange shapes, lopsided marbles, knobbly sheets a quarter inch thick, broken thin-walled bubbles, green, worm-like forms. Now, this material was originally known by a variety of names, including Trinity Dirt, crust, slag, alamogordo glass, and atomsite. But in a letter dated October 22, 1945, Louis Hempelman, the head of the Los Alamos National Laboratory's health physics group, referred to it as trinitite, the name that has stuck ever since. Now, trinitite was first scientifically described by C.S. Ross in a 1948 article in The American Mineralogist, and it is a very diverse mineral coming in all sorts of forms, and even colors. There is glassy trinitite, rounded smooth pebbles or splashes of glass, pancake trinitite, the thin smooth one to two centimeter crusts of glass that formed on top of the sand, which usually has numerous voids and unmelted grains of sand embedded in it, and finally bead and dumbbell trinitite, 
Pancake bead and dumbbell trinitite are very similar in structure to various natural glasses like fulgurites, formed with lightning strike sand, and tektites, formed by meteorite impacts. And as luck would have it, I actually have an authentic fulgurite here from my personal collection. Alas, I didn't collect this myself, I bought it at a curiosity shop in New York, but hopefully one day I will find one in the wild. Anyway, mineralogically, trinitite is composed mainly of fused arcosic sand, which is mainly quartz along with at least 25% feldspar, along with a variety of other clay minerals. In his 1948 article, Ross identifies two distinct varieties of trinitite with slightly different indices of refraction, and he concluded that the lower refracting variety was mainly pure fused quartz, while the higher refracting variety was other minerals such as feldspar and clay. Now, interestingly, in a 2021 paper by Luca Bindi, William Cold, and G. Nelson Eby, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, revealed that trinitite also contains ordered but non-periodic quasi-crystals, which are very rare in nature and typically only formed under extreme conditions like meteorite impacts. Now, it was initially assumed, and is still often reported, that trinitite was formed when the immense thermal energy from the fireball on the order of 4300 gigajoules raise the temperature of the surface of the sand to over 1500 degrees Celsius, melting it into a smooth sheet of glass. However, in 2005, Robert Hermes and William Strickfaden of Los Alamos National Laboratory ran simulations revealing that the fireball did not remain close enough to the ground for long enough and thus could not have deposited enough energy into the sand to create a glass layer as thick as was observed. Rather, they posited that dust and sand was instead drawn up into the much hotter interior of the fireball and melted into little droplets. Now, these droplets coalesced until they were too large and heavy to remain suspended in the fireball and rained back down to earth, forming that smooth layer of glass atop the sand. Now, farther out where the temperature was lower, these droplets cooled and solidified before they hit the ground, forming the bead and dumbbell varieties of trinitite. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, trinitite comes in a variety of colors, the most common being this distinctive bottle green. This is caused by iron impurities in the glass, both from the sand itself and the steel shot tower vaporized by the blast. Black trinitite also contains iron, but in much higher concentrations. Finally, red trinitite was mainly found in the northern quadrant of the crater, which corresponds to the position of the firing cables trailing out from the shot tower. It is the copper from these cables which imparted this variety with its distinctive red color. Now, as you might imagine, trinitite also contains a variety of trace elements from the atomic bomb itself as well as the surrounding environment. In addition to the aforementioned strontium-90, zirconium-97, molybdenum-99, cerium-144, and samarium-153, which are the products of plutonium fission, there is also unfissioned plutonium-239 and 240 from the bomb core, uranium-238 and 235 from the natural uranium tamper surrounding the core, cesium-137 and europium-152, 154, and 155, fission products of the aforementioned uranium, thorium-232 and potassium-40, naturally found in the sand in New Mexico, as well as various daughter isotopes from their decay chain, such as argon-40 and lead-212. There is also cobalt-60, formed by neutron activation of cobalt-59 in steel, americium-241, formed by neutron activation of plutonium-239 and 240 into plutonium-241, which then decays via beta emission, and sodium-24, formed by neutron activation of natural sodium-23 in the sand, which was found to account for nearly 90% of the most intense radiation immediately following the blast. Of course, glass like this is not unique to the Trinity site, and appears wherever atomic bombs have been detonated in proximity to sand, including the Nevada test site, the semi palatins test site in Kazakhstan, the Regiani test site in Algeria, and the Maralinga test site in Australia. However, what does make trinitite unique is a single trace element, barium-133. This is caused by the neutron activation of barium-132 found in baritol, a high explosive consisting of between 25 and 33% TNT, barium nitrate, and paraffin wax. And this was used in the high explosive lenses in the Trinity gadget, which compressed the plutonium core to critical density. The only other nuclear weapons using this explosive known to have been tested are the Soviet Union's first nuclear weapon, RDS-1, detonated on August 29, 1949, and India's first nuclear weapon, Pokhran-1, or Smiling Buddha, detonated on May 18, 1974. And since glass from those sites is not in wide circulation, if a piece of glass contains barium-133, it is almost guaranteed to be an authentic piece of trinitite. 
Now, at this point, you're probably wondering, well, is Trinitite safe to handle? And thankfully, the answer is yes. After 80 years, all of the short-lived intensely radioactive nuclides have decayed away. Indeed, if I hold my handheld scintillation counter up to the sample, it doesn't register anything above background radiation levels. Indeed, Trinitite typically emits only one micro röntgen or 9.6 nanograys per hour above background, with most of this being low penetrating alpha particles, which this instrument can't detect, produced by long-lived actinides like plutonium and americium. Still, you don't want to ingest or breathe this in because many of the longer-lived radionuclides, such as plutonium and americium, are toxic in and of themselves, and they can make their way easily into the bones and other tissues where the alpha particles that they emit can still cause a lot of damage. Indeed, the relative harmlessness of Trinitite was once used as a political weapon. See, following the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, rumors began to filter back to the United States that the lingering radiation from the bombings was causing long-term health effects and deaths among the survivors. And this presented the U.S. military with a potential PR disaster. So as a result, the military launched a concerted PR campaign, including that aforementioned press tour of the Trinity site in September 1945. Now, at the same time, jewelry designer Mark Coven designed a collection of earrings, brooches, and other jewelry made of Trinitite, which were worn at public events by celebrities like actress Merle Oberon and model Pat Burridge. And despite the fact that the truth about the lingering effects of radiation in Japan inevitably made their way into the American public consciousness, Thanks to this publicity campaign, Trinitite became extremely popular on the collector's market, and tons of the stuff were gathered before 1952 when the Atomic Energy Commission ordered all of it bulldozed into the crater and covered over with sand. Today, the Trinity site is open only two days a year to the public, and you are expressly forbidden from collecting any Trinitite you find on pain of fines and imprisonment. However, Trinitite collected prior to 1952 is fair game, and so much of it entered the collector's market prior to that date that you can still pick up a sample for yourself for a reasonable price. I got this off of United Nuclear for around $40, though if you go on their site, this sample size is no longer available, and the smallest size that they have will run you around $89. Still, that's a very reasonable price for being able to hold such a powerful relic of the atomic age in your hands. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time in another video where we'll look at yet more nuclear relics and their fascinating objects just like this. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.